Okay, so our last speaker is Sergei Shemyakov um, uh, from the uni Marseille University, if I remember correctly. Yes, yes. And he's going to talk about the comparison of Newton and Erich Albert root finding dynamical systems, practice and theory. Please. Um, thank you. So today is the last, uh, my talk is the last talk of one of the most intense days of the conference. And this, uh, this is not going to be too complicated. So um, hopefully um, you will be able to survive till the end. And um, I have to apologize in advance. Uh, my test runs showed that I will be some couple of minutes later than my 30 minute um, time. Hopefully this is okay. So let's uh, maybe begin without further distractions. Uh, my talk will be based on a paper um, published last year together with Anton Shemekov, Simon Schmidt, uh, Dima Romance of Roma Chernoff and Dirk Schleicher. And um, so one of the one of the natural places in mathematics where dynamical systems arise um, is uh, numerical methods and namely some root finding methods. So generally what, what is a root finder? You pick you have some function zeros of which you want to find, and you pick some starting points. Then you have your iterative method that uh, does some some steps to update your approximation and well it should um, and in the end it should give you the approximations for the roots of the function. So in my talk I will focus on two methods, Newton's method and Elich, Elich Hubbard method. And the goal for root finding uh, that that I put here is to find all the roots of um, of some polynomial. But well the, these methods work more generally for some holomorphic functions but um, we will look under polynomials. So Newton is a complex one-dimensional method. You can see here how the wave function is computed. And um, any Hubbard would be a d-dimensional dynamical system. So it contains, um, well, d is, uh, throughout my talk, d would be the power of the polynomial that you consider, uh, the degree. Um, so any Hubbard ha has d approximations to the root simultaneously, and uh, it computes updates um, taking into account all the other approximations. So my, my talk is uh, more on the practical side, and it also lies exactly on the intersection of numerical community and dynamical community. And what you have to know about these communities is that numerical people are really practice oriented and um, I think some glimpse of this um, you could catch in the yesterday's talk of Dirk. And uh, the, the dynamics community is more theoretical. Um, so that's... Um, and so there are some theoretical results for Newton's method. Uh, there is this, um, this uh, remarkable paper of 2001 by um, John Hubbard, Dick Schleicher and Sutherland. And uh, well, there are of course other results, but in this paper, uh, they uh, they present the um, asymptotical estimates for for the efficiency of Newton in the worst possible case, and then they show how to find how to find all the roots of polynomials uh, generally. So again, in the worst possible case, and um, so they they study they study the general dynamics of Newton. But the, the, in, in the practical community, in the numerical um, community, there are not so many results on, um, well, at least not, not that I'm aware of uh, concerning Newton method. Well, on, the, on the contrary, there are not so many theoretical results for Eddie Hubbard. Okay, of course, there is some local theory. This is, this is um, something quite simple. Um, Except from this, I want to mention the recent ideas about um, more general dynamics. So this is about general convergence by uh, Renke from last year. This is um, also something you can hear on Thursday. Um, uh, there, um, Bernhardt tried to figure out when the method is not convergent. Uh, but it's not too surprising that there are not so many 
the theoretical results about Eddie Hubbard. As I said, this is a multidimensional dynamical system. So, well, it's a non-trivial one. And um, those um, raise many questions, even in the community of uh, dynamical people. So the goal of my talk um, is to speak about the experiments that we've performed to compare the performance of uh, Newton and Eddie Hubbard. And I want to uh, present uh, two explanations of the results, one from practical um, perspective, another from theoretical perspective. Well, and um, we'll see whether uh, numerical people can learn something from dynamical people. Now, first, let me uh, let me start by introducing these methods a bit. And here you can see um, the formula for for Newton. Uh, this this would be the update um, the, the step, um, the the Newton step. And one nice way to think about Newton function is electrostatic interpretation. So what you do, you put positive charges at, at the roots of a particular polynomial that you've chosen. And um, you put a negative charge at the iterate, and the force, the electrostatic force felt at the iterate would um, correspond to this Newton update term. And um, when you think about this interpretation, then a couple of properties of, of this root finder become uh, obvious. For example, well, we know um, local behavior. This is uh, quite a popular numerical analysis exercise for, um, for students. We have quadratic convergence at simple roots of the polynomial, so we uh, quickly converge when we start close to the roots, and um, we have linear convergence for higher, higher order roots. But the real question for, for Newton is what happens when we start further away from roots, um, or how do we pick starting points in general? But this is um, this is less clear. Um, and uh, just to illustrate one of the one of the difficulties that can happen, I want to speak about attracting cycles for Newton. So, what attracting cycles? Um, if if you have some uh, starting point for the iteration of your Newton method, then it might well happen that it does not converge to any of the roots. If you if you look at this picture, what you see here is a dynamical plane for Newton method and uh, the three white. Crosses represent the uh, roots of polynomial of degree three. And uh, all this is picture is taken from the paper of Hubbard, uh, Scheich, and Sutherland that I announced before. And uh, probably you've seen this in Duke's talk as well. But uh, here you see different points uh, colored different colors. And all the blue points converge to this root, all the green points converge to this root, and all the red points con converge here. And what you can see, there are these disks of black points, which correspond, well, those are points that do not converge to any of the roots. They, um, they, um, they converge to, the, to this cycle here. So the point here is not there and, and then back. And the other disks converge, um, converge to, this, to this disk as well. Well, so you can see it's um, there are some non-trivial things to be said about global dynamics for Newton. Well, um, but what, what can we say? Well, infinity is a repelling point, and zeros of um, of polynomial are attracting or super attracting points, and obviously this is the reason why Newton works as a refiner. And um, poles. There are poles of Newton function. Those those uh, happen to be the critical points of the polynomial, but they don't create uh, problems because it's quite hard to hit them in practice. And also, if you look at the picture, so the, the set of all the points that converge to some root, for example, all the blue points, would uh, would be uh, a basin of attraction for the blue root, and then the immediate basin is the set is the connected component of. Um, Basin of attraction that contains this root, and obviously for tool set for Newton map contains um, basins of attraction for different roots. It also contains the um, attracting cycles and the disks around them. 
Well, and um, in practice, points from Julia set, which would be the boundary between all these disks, the points from Julia set could create problems because if you start iterating from, from the Julia set, you will also never converge to a root. But in practice, it's impossible to hit Julia set. So this is not something to worry about. And the last um, the last piece of theory that we'll need a bit later, and I will speak about it more um, in more details later, it channels to infinity. So those are the excesses, various excesses from the roots to infinity here. Each root has just one channel, and later you'll see um, there are more general cases. Okay, but why channels are helpful to us? If we want to find all the roots of a, of, of a polynomial, then um, somehow we have to guarantee that for each root, you have a starting point in the basin of attraction of this root. And channels help us to pick starting points to do exactly this. Um, so if, we, if we look at this picture, what you see here is a dynamical plane for Newton map for polynomial degree 50. There are 47 roots here on a circle. And there are three different roots um, inside. And now here you can see two thin gray lines. And in fact, those are starting points for the iteration. So if you put starting points there, then you guarantee that um, the starting point will hit the channels for all the roots. And that's exactly the role of the channels to um, in, in the theory of Newton method. Okay, but um, this is this all looks nice in theory, but um, when we when you come to solve some some actual polynomials with Newton method and you try to to pick starting points like this, you will quickly realize that it's a bad idea, just because there are too many points, and even before you find any roots, and just before the, the points come closer here, you already spent a lot of time computing the Newton iterates, and this uh, this becomes to uh, too much of a computation. So how, how do we deal with this in practice? That's, um, that's an idea called iterated refinement. Now the, the idea is you, you start not with many um, not with many points like here, but with just, um, just a few, like 64 in, in most of our experiments. And you add new orbits um, as you iterate. So you may imagine yourself that you have some three orbits going together. And at first, they just iterate uh, in a parallel fashion. Nothing really, um, nothing interesting is going on between them. Or you may also think that the triangle form by this iterates does not change too much with each iteration. But at some point, um, some, some non-trivial dynamics of Newton map will happen between them. And this triangle will get squished somehow. And this is how we know that that um, we need some more iterations to put between those. And that's when we refine and, and we continue iterating the new orbits as well. So exactly this idea was implemented by um, uh, two students, uh, Robin Stoll and Marvin Randich, which uh, helped them to find the roots of some specific polynomials of degrees um, up to 1 million, 1 billion on, on, on their own computers. So this is also something that Dirk mentioned. And here is the illustration of iterated refinement method. So what you see here is um, a polynomial, the roots of which are distributed on this dendrite Julia set. So this, uh, this, this blue um, the points here. And we start from our own side. There are not so many starting points. But as they move closer, you see they catch some complicated so some more uh, interesting dynamics between, and we add more and more points. And as we get closer to this dendrite where all the roots are located, we have many, many orbits. And well, those happen to find all the roots. OK, so this is what I have to say about Newton and about Eddie Hubbard. Well, here, here is the formula for, for Eddie Hubbard update function. From the formula, you can tell that this function takes in a vector of, uh, of D approximations, where again, the D is as the degree of polynomial or the number of roots. And um, we update 
all the all the components take into account the other components. But this formula is quite hard to understand. And just tear it like this. It uh, comes out as a Newton method applied to one component um, on the assumption that all the other components have found uh, found the roots of the nodules. But again, um, there is a nice and visual electrostatic uh, interpretation for, for this method. If we put positive charges as root, at roots um, in the same way as we did for Newton, and we put negative charges um, at all the d different iterates, um, then what we'll see, the, the, the iterates will push each other away, but the, the roots will pull different iterates uh, to themselves. So th that's that's roughly how Erlich Abert finds um, finds the roots of polynomials. Well, um, so the as I said, the local conversion force is known for Erlich Abert, and it's um, again super linear for simple zeros and it's linear for multiple zeros. And the the question whether there are any attracting cycles for Eddie Hubbard is still open. Uh, but as I told you, Bernd uh, Heinke have uh, found some unexpected diverging orbits for Eddie Hubbard. And also, he has some good reasons to think that there should be a attracting cycle as well, but they are a bit harder to find. But generally, um, not, as you see, not much is known about this. Okay, so now after I cover the um, the methods them, themselves, I come to to the experiments that we've performed. Um, so um, I want to tell about the polynomials that we've considered, and although I will present uh, the experimental results not for all of the polynomials, I wanted to say that um, that we really considered quite quite a number of different ones, um, and those that. Um, um, so the, those are the polynomials that we found out to be important. Okay, so the first class are iterated quadratic polynomials. Those have roots on um, on Julia sets for some quadratic um, polynomials. In in the, in the on the next slide, I'll show you the results for z square plus i. The um, uh, roots will be spread on on the cauliflower. And then we had Chebyshev and Nijanta polynomials. Those have real roots. And next, we experimented with different geometrical roots configuration to check some assumptions on some, some conjectures on the geometry of dynamics. Uh, we had polynomials with roots randomly distributed on a circle, on a semicircle, um, roots perturbed on a circle, randomly distributed in a disk, on a square grid, in uh, separated disk clusters, and on a segment. Um, so I don't want to um, give you too much technical details, but there is one thing that I think I should tell about, because that turned out to be quite important, about fast and slow relation of polynomials. When you have a polynomial uh, of degree d, then um, you can usually evaluate it in linear time. For example, if it's given by, by its coefficients, um, so this we will we will call slow evaluation of polynomial because sometimes when you have a polynomial of degree d, you can evaluate it in logarithmic time from the degree. And this happens, for example, for the situated quadratic polynomials, where you just um, if you have a polynomial of degree two to the ten in, in ten iterations, you can um, by squaring and adding some number, you can uh, compute the the value of a polynomial at particular points. So the fast and slow relation was something that we changed in our experiments. Also, there were some other variable parameters. Um, and in, in total, we're trying to evaluate, the, we're evaluating the, the, the complete number of um, operations performed by um, different finding methods. So next, on the next slides, we'll see the results for total number of operations for Newton. Um, and this uh, is with the trade refinement and um, our implementation of Ehrlich Abert. Over here um, on this graph, you see um, th th those are the polynomials with um, the roots on the Julia sets, on the cauliflower, iterate quadratic polynomials. 
And here you can already see the difference for fast and slow evaluation. So here is here are the operations for Newton fast evaluation, here are Newton slow evaluation, and um, these two are early habit for slow and fast. One surprising result is that a Newton profits from fast evaluation from the logarithmic evaluation much more than Eli Hubbard, um, as it seems from, from the picture. And the explanation is that um, well, Newton, the, the most computations that Newton performs is evaluating polynomials. And um, when, if you look at the formula for Eli Hubbard, there is this other term that's not polynomial that we also have to compute. And, um, but you, you still can see that even with slow evaluation, uh, Newton um, outperforms any Hubbard for bigger um, degrees and um, also uh, the, the graph is log log scale. So um, just probably can notice this from the axis. Um, so another, and then the next, um, Results they want to present for polynomials with the roots of the circle. And here again, um, you can see that Newton outperforms Sally Hubbard in the long run. Um, and the lines here are a little bit jagged just because the, the data points that we had were not evenly spaced on this logarithmic, logarithmic um, axis. Okay, and now for two uh, cases when um, Ellie Hubbard outperformed um, Newton's method. These are polynomials with random roots in a unit disk, and the polynomials with uh, roots on a square grid. Now here um, you can see that uh, it looks like Eli Hubbard is being more efficient. And I also have uh, wanted to remark that in all of the polynomials where some, some randomness was present in the distribution of roots, we averaged out through several um, several experiment runs. Okay, so what, um, what conclusions do we make from the experiments that we performed? Well, the first one is a little bit unexpected. Well, as I said, when you can evaluate the polynomial logarithmic time, then Newton seems to have more of an advantage. And uh, this is, um, I think this is one of the reasons why uh, Marvin and Robin were successful in finding um, in solving polynomials of such big degrees, I think they would not be able to get to 1 billion if they were using log uh, not logarithmic, but linear evaluation. But um, still, even without this logarithmic evaluation, um, there is another case when Newton seems to be a more of an advantage. And this is namely when the roots are well exposed to the infinity, kind of they are, they are lying close to the convex hull of the roots. And in all of the cases, in all the other cases, we have observed that Eddie Hubbard was was more um, was more efficient. So um, a practical explanation for this is just when you run this iteration in real time and you observe what orbits are doing and how they are finding the roots, Newton really starts searching from the outside, and the, the approximations converge to the roots, and um, that's why the the roots that are well exposed they are found much easier. And another difficulty is added by the iterated refinement method. So if, the, if there are many roots in the, in the center of, uh, so somehow inside the convex hull of roots, then the iterates come to the boundary, and then they notice a lot of complicated dynamics, and they spawn a lot of new iterates. And then these iterates tend, tend to take quite some time to find the roots inside. So this is the practical problem. Uh, that you see here for the for the roots, which are hidden well inside, and um, Eli Hubbard seems to search for all the roots simultaneously. And uh, generally, from our observations, we saw that this method tends to be less sensitive to the starting points. If you take the starting points somehow outside of the roots, inside the roots, well, um, well far away, um, somehow all these different cases were not um, too much different in terms of resulting performance. Okay, but um, there is still another viewpoint that I want to present to you about why Newton might be efficient for those foods. And um, I want to quickly remind you about the immediate basin and the channels. So here you see the, the immediate basin would be this thing for blue, 
root and Fourier root to be this one, and the channels, as I said, th those axes to infinity. Um, you see the blue one has two axes, green one has three, and red has also three. The rest is just one channel. And um, already from this picture, you can see that some channels are thicker or wider, some are thinner. For example, for green one, this is quite a wide channel, those, those look quite thin. And um, there is a way to make this precise on this, this definition. If you look far away from, from the close to infinity, and then you can factorize the channel by the dynamics, by your Newton map. You'll get a Riemann surface homomorphic to an annulus, so then the width of a channel would be the modulus of this annulus. And why, why is the width of channels important uh, notion for us? Um, now we, we shift our minds back to the theoretical approach. And in the theoretical approach, if you remember, the channels helped us to hit the, all, the, all the roots, right? And um, it's, if the channels are wide, then it's easy to, to hit them with the starting points. And that's exactly um, what we did back then. So um, next, I want to um, present you a couple of um, simple propositions from, from the, the paper um, Robert Schleich and Sutherland. Um, the, the first one, if you have a root uh, and the immediate basin of this root has m different critical points of the Newton map, then this root has a channel of width at least pi over log m. And in terms of asymptotics, you can think about this of pi of log d. Uh, so it would be of the same order in the worst possible case. And this is an illustration of the, of the popular and, um, and very nice um, idea in complex dynamics that critical points uh, control the dynamics. And another manifestation of this principle is, is this proposition here. Again, if some root has n um, m critical points in, inside its immediate basin, then it has exactly m different channels to infinity. And um, you, you can um, remember that the root itself is a critical point, so um, there is at least one channel to infinity. And uh, next proposition speaks about the channels for, for real roots. Um, if you have a polynomial with simple real roots, then each root has a channel of width at least pi over log 3. And why is this proposition uh, important? Well, as I said, the wider the channel, the easier it is to hit. And um, in general case, you have something like pi over log d. So here in this proposition, you win a factor of log d in um, in total, um, in total uh, symptotics of the al algorithm. And the proof of this proposition is quite simple. So um, um, just to quickly go through it, the Newton method is a Newton function is a rational function with 2d minus two critical points. And as you will see here, each critical point correspond, corresponds to a channel. But if all the roots lie on the real axis, then all the, all the roots, except for the smallest one, the biggest one, should have at least two channels, and just um, due to sym symmetry reasons. And that tells us that um, you can easily compute that which each um, root has, should have a channel with, with at least pi over log 3. So um, the... Now, next, I want to present the conjecture that is um, um, that's this theoretical viewpoint for the outer roots that I um, advertised. So if we have some root alpha of a polynomial that lies on the boundary of convex hull of roots, then we hypothesize that it has a channel with a width at least pi over log 3. Again, if, um, if we prove this conjecture, we improve the theoretical estimates by log d. And this would give us theoretical explanation why Newton finds these roots better. Um, and I really believe this conjecture to be true just because if you picture yourself the real case and you move some of the roots below the line and you pick some root with the channel going up, then um, 
it's pretty easy to imagine that this channel cannot get narrower um, as, as you move otherwise below. So this would be the proof for this conjecture if you make it precise, but somehow um, I didn't manage to find the time to, uh, to think about this too much. But um, so what um, to wrap this up here, I, I think I have um, presented some evidence about why Newton method is especially efficient in finding the roots that are well exposed to infinity. One is practical. This is, this is just the, the roots that the iterate starting from the outside see the first. And one is theoretical, namely it's, um, this happens in slightly different setting, but it's much easier to, uh, to hit the channels for such, such roots with starting points. And um, um, I think the, the common um, denominator be between below this, these two um, ideas is that if you have some polynomial where roots are well exposed to infinity, then you might prefer using Newton's method instead of some other methods to find the truths. And I think this, this uh, talk gives a good example how theory and practice interplane support each other because originally this all started with a theoretical question what happens uh, for Newton's method when the roots are on the unit circle and then we run the experiments and we saw that there were not the roots on the unit circle that we are interested in but rather roots line on the convex hull of roots and now if we prove this conjecture that you saw on the previous slide, then um, it would give some theoretical explanation about why Newton method indeed um, prefers such roots. So this is, um, this is this back and forth between theory and practice. Uh, but generally, definitely more experiments are needed for, um, for saying more things about this. Since we've run these experiments, and this was a couple of years ago, we learned that the numerical people um, working with Eddie Hubbard method thought of some optimization for Eddie Hubbard that could be implemented. We also have some optimization for Newton, namely we can parallelize computations. So there are still some ideas to do and see how, how the methods compete after all. But I think we can, uh, we can agree that this discussion um, brightens the connection between numerical people, dynamical people, and it improves the finding and definitely gives us some, some new understanding of the, of these dynamical systems and methods that are used. So here, that's um, my uh, place to finish. Thanks for the attention. Thank you very much.